In 2012, the world did not end, and Battleship happened. Mahalo, mother. But the year wasn't a total disappointment. On its face, Jack Reacher doesn't seem like the kind of film to write home about. A classic mystery thriller featuring a generic aloof masculine lead, whose name is the title of the film, the cover art of which is more reliant on star power than creativity like come on people. It's a project that understandably doesn't grab most people's attention or interest, but before long I hope I can make a case for why it deserves both. Jack Reacher is no masterpiece, but where it shines is in its careful delivery of vital plot information. It wastes no time establishing the mystery on which our characters will be focused for the rest of the movie. We open to a montage of an assassin, alias Charlie, cutting between the various stages of a mass shooting, preparation, execution, and aftermath. As the montage concludes, the camera slowly pans around an interrogation room only to reveal that the man the cops caught is not Charlie. This is James Barr, a scapegoat who nobody will think twice about convicting based on his history of misdeeds. I him. didn't come here to help him. I came here to bury him. The shots we saw of Barr making his own bullets during the montage were accurate though, so the transition from his dirty thumb to the interrogation scene was deliberate misdirection. The story begins by showing us how the crime really happened. What'll keep you invested is wondering why. Why does everyone care so much about James Barr? Why does Barr explicitly ask for Reacher instead of a lawyer? Why does Reacher see an incomplete puzzle where everyone else sees an open and shut case? As far as he's concerned, Barr planned the crime like a total amateur, facing the sun while his targets could only have moved laterally from his perspective, leaving shell casings behind despite using a van to drive to and from the crime scene, and, strangest of all, paying for parking. The film invites us into Reacher's mind as he reconstructs the crime and relentlessly pursues the truth. The mystery comes to a head when Reacher tells Helen Roden, defense attorney and his partner on the case, that Barr must have been framed. The opening scene was only the half of it. Yes, Charlie did really kill those five people, and yes, this is how it happened. But what we weren't initially aware of was that four of the five victims were chosen at random to mask the assassination of one key target. The MO of an erratic mass shooting matched Barr's previous crime, making him the perfect cover. It was such a great crime scene. No one stopped to think it might be too great. Jack Reacher, the character, is a methodical, sardonic vigilante never crumbling under pressure or missing an opportunity for an unnecessarily snide remark. If this man were real, then all other men alive might as well roll over and die because he's simply the hottest thing since sliced bread. He can maneuver his way through conversation like an expert gymnast, his detective skills are unrivaled, and he knows how to fight multiple enemies simultaneously. He has charisma, undeniably, but it's the type of charisma that can easily dip from endearing to uncanny. Honestly, this movie toots its lead character's horn like a clown with nothing to lose. Whether it be supporting cast who look at Reacher with undying adoration, even though they're actually working for the villains, or Reacher himself outmatching everyone he faces, regardless of context, or the world seemingly contorting itself to make him look cool, the film takes the form of an unapologetic male power fantasy. Which works well in conflict scenarios, where Reacher must rely on years of experience in bar fights, but doesn't work so well in his interactions with women, which play like bad fanfiction. Reacher is by no means a perfect character, but if you were dead set on playing the Gary Stu card, your best bet would be to appeal to the meta. With scenes like this, in which his interactions are framed as authentically flirty, but come off as forced and awkward to people from the real world. You see, Reacher explained that he had just washed his shirt, so it makes sense that he's not wearing it while talking to his drop-dead gorgeous associate in a motel room. Is this whole situation explained? Yes. Is it justified? No. And what about this scene? Reacher interrogates Sandy, nearly bringing her to tears, only for her to offer herself as a date later the same day. Reacher, being the honorable uncle archetype he is, denies her advances and changes the subject. But let's not brush past the fact that we're expected to believe that this man is so irresistible that after intimidating a woman for information and stealing her car, she would only become more infatuated with him. Ted's mail was as strange as anybody's mail could be. He got marriage proposals, lots and lots of women sent him pictures, some sent them nude pictures to him. I'm not afraid of him. He just doesn't look like the type to kill somebody. You try to imagine yourself in his place and to see how he's feeling, looking at the pillows with blood stains and everything, and if, if he really did it or not. There was an assumption about Ted's victims that they all wore their hair long, parted in the middle, and wore hoop earrings. So women would come to court with their hair parted in the middle wearing hoop earrings. A couple of them even dyed their hair the right kind of brown. Almost as though Sandy's entire purpose in the plot is to endear Reacher to her and die to motivate him to kill Charlie. 
Speaking of the meta, watch out boys, we got an edgelord over here. The Zek is a classic dark corner dingy lair tortured soul villain. A mainstay in action cinema that further cements the film as an homage to cheesy yet gripping crime thrillers of generations past. As unnecessary as the Zek is, he's integrated well enough into the plot that he doesn't spoil the more sophisticated narrative elements, but not so well that you're likely to remember him while he's off screen. In keeping with the film's tropey style, the Zek is more a box to be ticked than a purposeful character. This movie did not need a mustache-twirling capital V villain. Charlie, an assassin working for a parasitic corporation, is enough of an antagonist. The construction conspiracy subplot was convoluted enough without a nefarious old man whose grand motivation is We take what can be taken. This is what we do. Jack Reacher is a classic by virtue of what it borrows from other classics of the same timeless and captivating nature. The movie is filled with details and developments which, in isolation, at first glance, make sense. But once you notice the narrative is moving at the perfect speed to maintain your engagement without giving you room to think about what just happened, it becomes clear that Jack Reacher is clever in the micro but rather contrived in the macro. It pays respect to what came before by reveling in its witty yet corny writing and commits itself to delivering an enthralling mystery and masculine joyride at the same time. A flawed but deeply satisfying piece of fiction. So how does the sequel, Never Go Back, fare against its progenitor? Let's not mince words here. From the get-go, the story is non-functional. Whatever logical integrity Jack Reacher had to cling to has been abandoned for a rushed, poorly thought-out follow-up to a film that had incredible franchise potential. I understand that Jack Reacher didn't resonate with many fans of the books, largely owed to the casting, but let the factions of fans be united against Never Go Back for taking a steaming dump all over the first movie and the books alike. It doesn't matter where I start and end with my criticism because it's all the same. Never Go Back does everything the first movie did, but worse. And I'm only being slightly hyperbolic. It appears that Reacher got into a fight in order to lure this dirty sheriff to a sting. But these two events are entirely unconnected. He could have beat these guys up and walked away, and could have exposed this sheriff for human trafficking independently of each other. If these events are somehow related, then why did Reacher need to wallop these guys in order to arrest the dirty cop? Why not just give the relevant information to the military police and keep that nice shirt clean? Alternatively, maybe he didn't want to fight these guys, but they forced him into action. So, knowing that he would be arrested for the fight, he quickly put in place all the pieces necessary for the sheriff to be arrested instead, meaning that he must have had prior knowledge of his human trafficking exploits and was holding onto it in case he got arrested for a brawl in this specific town? Either Reacher is gratuitously violent, criminally negligent, or monumentally lucky. This entire scene has no bearing on the rest of the movie besides setting the tone for what's to come. A messy, contrived, uninspired story that desperately needs you not to think about what's happening and hopes you'll be sated by simply seeing the guy from the poster on screen. But even then, Never Go Back does not depict the Reacher we once knew. As with the first film, there's a mystery Reacher gets unwittingly roped into, but this time around, instead of an engaging, almost paradoxical event prompting Reacher out of the shadows, he gets told he has a daughter who he has no clue about and investigates purely so that she can burden the movie with her presence. There's a conspiracy Reacher has a vested interest in uncovering, only now, it's so detached from what happens in the rest of the movie that when they eventually expose the bad guy's corruption, it's anticlimactic and quickly brushed aside to focus on the character drama. There is an obligatory female who needs Reacher's help, only this character is basically the inverse of Helen Roden. Major Susan Turner is a badass. She's skilled in combat, well-versed in military protocol, and doesn't buckle under pressure. Also unlike Helen Roden, she influences none of the plot, clashes with Reacher for petty reasons, and has no character arc. She goes from prestigious military lady, to fugitive, to exonerated prestigious military lady. Her character does not change. Contrast that with the traumatic character-developing moments Helen has in every other scene. Bizarrely, Reacher and Helen had a foundation on which they could have built a relationship by the end of the first movie. They met under strenuous circumstances and bonded over their brush with mortality. But Reacher is a drifter, so naturally he went on his merry way, leaving all that wife potential behind. Flash forward four years to never go back, and after busting a bad cop, Reacher meets Major Turner for the first time that same night, over the phone, and they spend an indeterminate amount of time flirting through the airwaves while Reacher makes his way to Washington to see her. After having walked away from Helen? 
We saw Reacher choose not to nurture what could have been a beautiful relationship. Nothing wrong with that from a character standpoint, as it tells us a lot about the type of person he is. That he's willing to sacrifice love to maintain his anonymity and freedom. This is a problem for Never Go Back, though, because his crush on a woman he's never met before, based on brief sexually charged phone calls, betrays his character as Jack Reacher established it. Reacher had every reason to follow through with Helen, but didn't. In Never Go Back, he pursues Turner with as much motivation a pocket-protected Poindexter has to ask the captain of the cheerleading team to prom. Little more than butterflies. When Reacher arrives in DC, Turner has been taken into custody and, unbeknown to everyone except Reacher, is set to be disappeared as not to foil the villain's evil plans. He quickly sets out to question Turner's defense attorney, Colonel Moorcroft, which is where the bombshell that he has a daughter is dropped on him, as gracefully as you would tell someone that you performed the wrong surgery on their mother, leaving her with an amputated leg and a failing liver. Colonel Morgan is in on the conspiracy and so seizes the opportunity to take Reacher out of the picture as well, sending a mercenary to kill Colonel Moorcroft, thus framing Reacher for his death. In the initial interrogation, he is childishly uncooperative while still trying to figure out why he's there. One thing you have to understand about Jack Reacher is that his dialogue is inhumanly snappy. This man is sharper than a Hattori Hanzo blade and jumps at every opportunity to inject his wit into mundane conversation. At best, this makes him enjoyable to observe while bouncing off the personalities around him, and at worst is a cheap substitute for a personality. I'm Sandy. So was I. Last week. On a beach in Florida. But in this scene, he comes off like a petulant twerp just for the sake of it. And the hot lawyer next to him giggles like a schoolgirl as though what he's doing is charming. It's not. It's uncreative and lame. You're under no obligation to say anything, Major. Upon leaving yesterday, did you attempt to contact Major Turner? I can't afford you. I'm not a hooker. Oh, then I really can't afford you. Did you confront her attorney, Colonel Moorcroft, at Fort Dyer at 1100? Yes. Yes what? Yes, I understand. I don't have to say anything. Hey, outside. Pay your check first. I'll pay later. You won't be able to. You think? All the time. You should try it. We're 16 minutes in and Reacher is certain that Turner has been framed and convinced that whoever did it plans to kill her while she's isolated. Compare this with the time and care and attention to detail he needed to make progress in the first film. Apples to rotten oranges. From here on out, Reacher pretty much does whatever he wants with no consequences. Assaults a soldier just doing his job, potentially giving him brain damage. Escapes the military base with Turner, the soldiers chasing them inexplicably being unable to see two grown adults skulking between cars in broad daylight. And after his maybe daughter joins them and they're set up in a motel in New Orleans, he just roams the streets as he pleases searching for clues. Some goons corner him in a warehouse and choose not to shoot him because of the classic you need me alive shtick, but the moment he finishes them off, Discount Charlie bursts in guns blazing. Even the civilians around him are zombified to the point that they don't hear Reacher knock out two goons on a packed plane. In the first movie, Reacher did questionable things in public as well, and the civilians were brought into the gag in an unrealistic but amusing way. Sure, it sacrifices realism for a fun payoff, but it all feeds into Reacher's aura of mystique and hyper-competence. If anything, it only reinforces how gallant and cool he is. I sincerely doubt that the folks behind this flick had some ambitious vision that backfired, resulting in this bland product. It seems that they just didn't have any passion or respect for the IP and simply wanted to churn out a sequel to bank on the success of the first one. I just don't know how else to say it, but the advancement of this plot relies on Reacher being lucky and his enemies being stupid. Because Reacher got too curious about the prospect of having a daughter, he unwittingly roped a young girl named Samantha into an international opium smuggling conspiracy being orchestrated by a military contracting company called Parasource. The Hunter, yes, that is his credited role, The Hunter, goes after Sam in order to use her as leverage against Reacher, but he and Turner get to her first because the guy named The Hunter didn't think to search the kitchen cupboards. What is Sam's purpose in the narrative? Well, she marginally speeds up their search for Prudhomme, a vet who could hold the key to unraveling the conspiracy. But besides that, all she really does is get in the way, namely by using a traceable cell phone and credit card which leads the villains right to her. If Sam hadn't jeopardized their mission by sneaking out one night in order to find the junkie den Prudhomme frequents, then Reacher and Turner would have taken slightly longer to find him. It's not like it's some monumental task to scour crack houses for one person whose photo you have on hand, but Sam did speed up the process for them, which I feel compelled to mention since her endangering their security like that actually has an impact on the plot. We then learn from Prudhomme that there's a Parasource flight set to leave the country at 10pm that night. Ah, ticking clocks, for when you have no creative or original way to raise the stakes. 
Let's take a look at how these pieces fit together. Reacher and Turner would not have uncovered the conspiracy before being arrested without Prudhomme's help. And they wouldn't have found Prudhomme in time if it wasn't for Sam. And Sam would not be with them, let alone even alive, if the hunter had bothered to check under the sink. And Turner would have been assassinated if Reacher hadn't been arrested that same day. And Reacher wouldn't have been arrested if Colonel Moorcroft hadn't been killed by the hunter for having spoken to Reacher. And Reacher wouldn't have been made aware of the suspicious circumstances surrounding Turner's arrest or the existence of his potential daughter if Leech hadn't led him to Colonel Moorcroft. Who is Leech, you may ask? Oh, she's super unimportant. She just drops Reacher vital plot information whenever he asks for it, even after he's been branded a fugitive. The issue here is that this story only unfolds the way it does because the world around Reacher bends to accommodate his goals. A great technique for crafting a cinematic badass, not so effective in fortifying your story against mild scrutiny. Not everything can go his way, of course. Our noble fugitives pick up Sam because Reacher's just too good-hearted to leave his could-be daughter to the hunter's wrath, and on the plane to New Orleans she mentions that her father, who she never knew, was in the military too, also stationed in Washington. A hero, and an asshole. And the only reason Reacher ever found out about Sam is because she told her mother to file a paternity suit against a complete stranger because she thought it would turn them a profit. That's right, Reacher is not the father. It's almost like you could write Sam out entirely and it would only be of benefit to the film. Exposing the Parasaurus conspiracy means proving that guns are being smuggled right under the authorities' noses, but when they open the weapon crates, nothing is missing. But just before the cops arrest these fugitives on any combination of assault, murder, or property damage charges that they've racked up over the past two days, Reacher has an epiphany. Parasaurus wasn't smuggling weapons away from the government, they were smuggling opium inside the weapons. Good thing they were transporting weapons that were both hollow and large enough to fit bags of drugs in them. Earlier, the plot had to account for Sam using a traceable cell phone at the school where Turner suggested they hide her, while she and Reacher handle grown-up business. Reacher insists that they leave immediately and is not too happy about bringing Sam along for the ride, but feels responsible for her all the same. He makes quite a fuss about the fact that phones are traceable, but when Sam reveals the credit cards she stole from another student at the school, instead of once more chastising her for endangering their mission and their lives, he looks distinctly chuffed. And this error in judgment, which is really on his and Turner's part, not the teenagers, is what leads the hunter straight to Sam while they're still at the Parasaurus airstrip. Hi, do you have room service? We got a hit on one of the stolen cards. After some more choppy fight scenes and chases where the runner has an inconsistent lead on the pursuers, Reacher manages to catch up to Sam, but the hunter got a hold of her off screen. I know I'm jumping around a lot, but to fully appreciate this sorry excuse of a climax, we need to go back to the night that Reacher retrieved the junkie husband photo and inexplicably survived this farce. Reacher returns to the inn, tired and troubled by what the hunter threatened. So I'm gonna take back my promise about not hurting the little girl. Turner is teaching Sam gun disarms, and Reacher reacts to Sam's enthusiasm with gloom and pessimism, raising the question, how does any aspect of this exchange make sense? Instead of telling the girls that he was followed, that they should leave, or just responding with sarcasm, he acid rains on Sam's parade. Why? Is it because his concern for her safety outweighs the fact that Turner is actively trying to train Sam in self-defense? No, 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 it's just because they needed to set up this line. If all you have left is that move, just assume you're dead already. So, while the pessimism could have been an uncomfortable but effective plot beat, leading Reacher to open up to Sam or Turner later on, revealing some depth to his character, it's actually just him being in a foul mood. At a time when morale could use a boost, Reacher resorts to an insensitive insult directed at student and teacher. When the time finally arises for him to embody the stoic dad archetype, he falters and lets his bad temper get the better of him. What is going on? Jack Reacher framed the titular character as snarky but endearing, brutish but moral, uncompromising but adaptable. Whatever nuance was put on the table, never go back swept off in favor of inserting an infantile, clumsy, unadulterated asshole. And the supporting cast does nothing to compensate for his lack of charm. Is it really so important that you make every decision? What decisions has she made leading up to this, you munchkin? What do you think we should do? Don't patronize me. Get that chip off your shoulder and act like a major. I got us the credit card, okay? We wouldn't have gotten on that plane without it. My dudette, you stole that student's bag because it was an easy score, just like you made your mother file the paternity suit that brought Reacher into your life because you thought she could make a quick buck off it. Don't go playing off your luck as strategy. I simply don't like anyone here. Emerson was more likable than this entire cast and he was a twist villain. What, because I'm a woman? I should be the babysitter? Yes. <laughs> so far, yeah, bring it low, that's right, step out and rotate. 
I'm pretty sure this was a tangent. Oh, right. She's in the street. How do you know? Because that's what I would do. Good thing for our heroes, and the set designers, that the entire climax takes place along this one crowded street. If it didn't, Reacher might not have noticed Sam being chased along the rooftops above, and the production team might have had to labor over a set piece for Reacher and the Hunter's final fight, set in and among the festivities. Imagine the combatants using the decorations in creative ways, leveraging their environment against their adversary, and constantly having to keep track of the panicked civilians around them. I think that would be cool. So anyway, back to the actual climax. You know what this means? It means we're dead already. And now, after two hours of dismal storytelling, we, the viewer, are desperately hoping for Reacher to make good on his promise to the Hunter. I'm gonna break your arms. I'm gonna break your legs. I'm gonna break your neck. After taking a fall like that, you could forgive the fighter's movements for being so sluggish and telegraphed, but after everything we endured to get here, Reacher's lethargic victory over the Hunter feels utterly anticlimactic. The real Tom Cruise was still kicking after breaking his foot performing a stunt for Mission Impossible. All the punishment that he and the audience alike have taken should warrant a greater spectacle than this. Jack Reacher's final fight is iconic. Held back only by the cliched context in which it takes place, this muddy brawl is what rounds out the film's core conflict. Reacher's motivations don't consist in simply closing cases, his drive is intrinsic. Where there's a mystery to be solved, there is also a villain to expose, and where crime is committed, there must be a culprit in need of righteous judgment. That is Reacher's motivation. The murder of five people, four of whom having no relation to the Zek scheme, was enough to set Reacher off. Seeking justice for the death of innocence is an integral part of his character and something that Never Go Back would rather tell than show you. You're like something feral. You've got their scent in your nose and all you want is blood. The first film made you believe that he was something elemental, an unstoppable vengeful force, a skilled detective and untempered crusader. Tom Cruise may not be right for the role, but at least he put in the effort. I mean to beat you to death and drink your blood from a boot. Reacher's fight against Charlie is not the resolution to the conspiracy, the mystery, or his being framed in the public eye. It's the resolution and conclusion to Charlie's evil. For killing those five people, and Sandy, in order to frame Barr and Reacher respectively, Charlie signed his own death warrant, because Reacher is a man with absolutely no qualms about killing bad guys. The simplicity of his mindset, combined with his capacity for wit and intelligence, is precisely what makes him such an engaging character. The film builds up the myth of Jack Reacher to the point that nothing short of biblical justice would satisfy. What about bringing him to justice? I just did. The first time around, Reacher's drive was simple, his motivations clear, his judgment final. Defeating Charlie in a fatigued skirmish was an opportunity for the film to make good on its promises to the audience and for Reacher to demonstrate his supremacy once again. In Never Go Back, Reacher's drive is confusing, his motivations flimsy, and his judgment undermined. It's difficult to see Reacher as the force of nature he once was while he fumbles through arguments, acts like a child under pressure, and is outmatched in combat for the sake of a gag. It just doesn't feel like Reacher. This fight scene is the film's final chance at catharsis. Yes, I am ignoring Sam and Reacher hugging. It's a wasted moment for a waste of a character. This fight, if anything, should be the thing that peaks audience investment, even if only briefly, so that we may be rewarded for our patience. And yet, sandwiched between the underwhelming resolution to the conspiracy subplot and the trying to be heartwarming but I honestly couldn't care less end to the father-daughter subplot, here lies this disappointment of a climax. The culmination of two hours worth of bad editing, lazy writing, and a crippling lack of charm. To sum up Jack Reacher Never Go Back in a word, you'd struggle to find one more apt than disappointing. Jack Reacher is very much a male power fantasy, 
Women love him, bad guys fear him, and nobody can best him. As far as tributes to the gritty and plot-armored action heroes of yesteryear go, it does a phenomenal job. Our hero is an off-the-grid, righteous-minded super detective. He dispatches of enemies with ease, banters with everyone he comes into contact with, and woos all the ladies in his immediate vicinity. He routinely impresses others with his aptitude for problem-solving, drives an old-fashioned car like a pro, and drops his weapon to fight the big bad hand-to-hand -hand for the climax. Hallmarks of a bygone era in storytelling, when heroes were allowed to be unashamedly badass, and every narrative shortcoming you could point out was likely in service of their badassery. The execution of these tropes was not only comfortably sewn into the narrative, but done so tastefully as to harken back to the stories from which it borrowed. Despite its formulaic structure and penchant for fawning over its namesake, Jack Reacher is a film which delivers gripping action, grounded characters, and an intriguing mystery. It's a mixed bag that leverages the best of classic action cinema to create something familiar but exciting. There is dramatic irony at play as the villains outright reveal the logistics of their plan before Reacher and Helen become aware of them. The opening of the film shows us the truth of the crime only for us to watch Reacher play catch-up. The combat choreography incorporates wide angles and gross, bold strikes to make the fighting appear unique and discernible to the viewer. The rate at which we learn about the crime and the victims, the gradual pulling back of the curtains, and the portrayal of an ex-military officer putting his skills to the test in a civilian case lend themselves to the film's rewatchability. In every way that counts, Never Go Back betrays Reacher's character as it was established. It is a disappointing film but a despicable sequel. One that seeks to exploit your admiration of its predecessor by reminding you of all the things that made it special while providing nothing of substance in its own right. Never Go Back fundamentally misunderstands what we love about Reacher. It's not enough to have him bashing skulls, doing detective work, and throwing around quips. One of the first film's strengths is how it portrays Reacher as just a small part in a much larger scheme. Only finding more questions after every answer makes Reacher and the audience aware of just how deep the conspiracy goes. It's a grand plot that had been set in motion long before Reacher was ever in the picture and was entirely unrelated to him. No conveniences, coincidences, or contrivances necessary. Helen Roden is a competent character with her own set of skills, but not a fighter by any means. That difference between her and Reacher is what makes their dynamic interesting. Instead of a bland, whiny female version of the lead character with whom he flirted before they ever met, Helen is a civilian whose mindset clashes with Reacher's in order to 1. flesh out her own character as a law-abiding out-of-her-depth attorney, and 2. demonstrate the contrast between Reacher's militant single-mindedness and the average person's desire for peaceful resolution to conflict. Helen Roden is the everyman of the story and she fills the role wonderfully. The Zek might be a mustache twirling cliche, but at least he was memorable. Never Go Back couldn't muster anything more noteworthy for its cast than the Hunter and a bunch of faceless suits with a foreboding disposition. Charlie was essentially the anti-reacher, the only antagonist who could potentially match him in a fight and whose evil is put on full display while acting friendly towards Sandy in order to buy him time to check that the coast is clear so that he can murder her. Never Go Back scraped the bottom of the barrel to give us the Hunter, a two-dimensional villain with all the import of a video game boss whose cutscenes you desperately wish you could skip. It might be too charitable to brand Sam as wasted potential, because that implies that her inclusion in the story could have been a good thing, and I sincerely doubt that. There are just so many moving parts, or rather, rotting remnants of parts, that need to work well in conjunction with one another in order to make this script function on a satisfying level that they should have either left certain aspects on the cutting room floor or scrapped it entirely. As it stands, they might as well have read Wikipedia's plot summary for the book and pitched the movie to investors from memory after weeks of binge drinking. Of course, adapting a book to the silver screen is no linear process. Adjustments must be made and toes are sure to be stepped on, but the results speak for themselves. The phrase, never go back, is a reference to how soldiers cannot escape the experiences that shaped them on the battlefield. Ultimately, it will stand as a warning label for anyone unsure about watching it, as the film itself will never achieve the merit that made its predecessor so successful and enjoyable. A failure of storytelling if there ever were one. So by all means, immerse yourself in a world where Tom Cruise plays Jack Reacher and everyone takes him seriously. Suspend your disbelief, as he acts out every masculine fantasy they could fit into a two-hour runtime, and revel in the style and charm of a film unafraid to show you a good time. And then, as though realizing that that flavor of ice cream which you cherished in your childhood now brings with it a rancid aftertaste, never go back. As always, I love discussion and debate, so if you have any criticism of my take on the Jack Reacher film series, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. See you next time.
suspend your disbelief as he acts out every masculine fantasy they could fit into a two-hour runtime and revel in the style and 